Welcome to Better Health Guy Blogcasts, empowering your better health. And now, here's Scott, your Better Health Guy. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal medical authority. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 21 of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. Today's special guest is Dr. Richard Horowitz, and the topic of the show is How Can I Get Better? Dr. Richard Horowitz is a board-certified internist in private practice in Hyde Park, New York. He is the medical director of the Hudson Valley Healing Arts Center, an integrative medical center which combines both classical and complementary approaches in the treatment of Lyme disease and other tick-borne disorders. He has treated over 12,000 chronic Lyme disease patients in the last 26 years, with patients coming from all over the United States, Canada, and Europe to his clinic in New York. He is one of the founding members and past president-elect of ILADS, the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society. He is also past president of the ILADEF, the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Educational Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the education of healthcare professionals on tick-borne diseases. Dr. Horowitz has presented at numerous local, national, and international scientific conferences on Lyme disease and has published on the role of co-infections and toxins in Lyme borreliosis. He was awarded the Humanitarian of the Year Award by Turn the Corner Foundation for his treatment of Lyme disease and has dedicated his life to helping those stricken with this devastating illness. He's written two best-selling books on Lyme disease. The first, Why Can't I Get Better? Solving the Mystery of Lyme and Chronic Diseases in 2013, and his most recent, How Can I Get Better? An Action Plan for Treating Resistant Lyme and Chronic Disease, which just came out in early 2017. Both of these are top resources for those that want to understand Lyme disease and all that comes with it. I'm honored to have Dr. Horowitz on the show today to share his immense experience with us. And now, my interview with Dr. Richard Horowitz. First off, I want to start by thanking you for all the work that you've done over the years for those of us that have dealt with Lyme disease or are currently dealing with Lyme disease. Your books have been a tremendous resource, not only for patients, but also for other doctors and practitioners. And I've really observed that they have really helped to bridge the gap between those people that really understand Lyme disease and those that are still in the process of understanding it. So thank you for your books. I appreciate you being here and thanks for spending the time today. Oh, sure. It's my pleasure. Excellent. So let's start by talking about MSIDS. Maybe you can tell us what is MSIDS, a little bit about the 16 nails in the foot model or your 16 point MSIDS map. What are some of the nails that we need to consider and why is it really important that we consider all of these different factors rather than just focusing on Lyme organisms if we really want to recover our health? Right. So MSID stands for Multiple Systemic Infectious Disease Syndrome. And the reason I describe it as if someone were going into a doctor's office with 16 nails is that what we usually find is that there are overlapping factors that are keeping most of these chronically ill patients sick. So, for example, we don't just find Lyme disease. Uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, but we will find relapsing fever Borrelia, uh, Borrelia hermsi, Borrelia miyamotoi. We're finding a lot of co-infections, specifically Babesia and Bartonella probably being at the top of the list, a lot of mycoplasma, but we're not really sure in all of these mycoplasma species how many are causing people to be ill. Uh, We're finding Q fever, tularemia, brucella. So a lot of infections, a lot of bacterial infections, sometimes viral infections that reactivate like Epstein-Barr herpes virus 6, Uh, CMV. Um, Parasites such as Babesia, but also other parasites like intestinal parasites or FL1953, Protomyxo rheumatica. So the essence is, is that many of these people who come to see me who are chronically ill have multiple infections, but they also have immune dysfunction, meaning that when they get Lyme, they can get autoimmune phenomenon with positive anti-nuclear antibodies, positive rheumatoid factors, And if we don't deal with these autoimmune phenomena, including even Hashimoto's thyroiditis, they won't get better. Um, The key point on the MSIDS model is inflammation, that at least eight out of these 16 points cause an inflammatory response. And we know that when people come in with Lyme and they're complaining of fatigue, pain, joint pain, muscle pain, nerve pain, which tends to migrate around the body, which is the hallmark of Lyme, 
uh, sleep disorders, mood disorders, memory problems. All of these are due to inflammation, inflammatory cytokines. But you also get inflammation from other infections, from leaky gut with food allergies, from mineral deficiencies. Um, you can get inflammation from sleep disorders. Most of the Lyme patients don't sleep. And then when you get all of this inflammation with free radicals and oxidative stress, it can damage the mitochondria of the body, causing people to be chronically ill, uh, contributing to some of the neuropathy that we see, like POTS, autonomic neuropathy. Uh, so we have all of these overlapping factors, and we find that in some patients, it might be hormones. The inflammation can shut down the pituitary and cause adrenal dysfunction, low testosterone, or irregular female hormones. So we have to be very, very careful because it's not just about treating infections. And this model was developed over 30 years now of seeing over 12,000 chronically ill people. And I really find for myself that it's the key to getting the vast majority of these people better. I absolutely agree. I've observed over the years that people get so focused on treating Borrelia, Bartonella, and Babesia and just keep hammering away at those few things and don't really look at all these other things that you're talking about in your 16-point model. And those that do and really take more of a holistic perspective seem to make much more progress. So I'm absolutely uh, resonating with your comments about that. How is Lyme disease transmitted? Do you think that it's potentially transmitted sexually? Is it transmitted during pregnancy? Is it potentially transmitted through breast? feeding? And then are there other insects beyond ticks that we think potentially expose people either to Lyme or to some of the other co-infections? So definitely there are other avenues of getting these tick-borne illnesses. And, and I would say probably apart from ticks, which is obviously the one that most people um, have where they get Lyme and co-infections, um, pregnancy and passing it on to the fetus has definitely been proven in the medical literature. Um, I saw a woman years ago uh, in my books, I call her Mary, um, for an obvious reason of Mary had Lyme disease. And this was a woman who'd been treated for two years for Lyme. She came into my medical office and said, I'm feeling completely fine, 100% uh, symptom free. And I said, are you absolutely sure? And she said, well, a couple of weeks ago, I had this brief migratory pain, um, literally for seconds. And I said, otherwise, that's it. You feel completely fine. And she said, yes. So I said, fine, why don't you get pregnant? This was probably two decades ago. And about 12 weeks into the pregnancy, she lost the baby. And we did DNA analysis on the fetus and on the placenta, and it was positive for Lyme. She tried again. The exact same thing happened with DNA PCR evidence that Borrelia still existed in her body and was being transmitted to the fetus. There are a lot of medical articles at this point confirming transmission, but not just transmission for Lyme disease. There's also transmission of Babesia, uh, there's a case presentation I do definitely need to write up in the medical literature of this woman who's had four pregnancies, and in the last two pregnancies, she relapsed in the third trimester of her pregnancy, where she had an active Babesia fish test. Uh, the fluorescent in C2 hybridization was positive. She had drenching night sweats and chills, and I had to give her clindamycin with Mepron and Zithromax in the third trimester to prevent her from passing it on to the fetus, because if you don't, the baby can die at birth from a hemolytic anemia where the blood cells will burst apart. It can be fatal for the, the child. So Babesia can be transmitted, Lyme is transmitted, this new relapsing fever Borrelia, like uh, Borrelia miyamotoi, is able to be transmitted. It can cause um, hemorrhaging in mothers, it can cause strokes and disseminated intravascular coagulation. Um, these are very dangerous, actually, for pregnant women, and Bartonella can be transmitted, as well as rickettsial infections. So we have to definitely educate the doctors. Um, and the OBGYNs, I'm not sure they are really cognizant that they should be screening women. And the MSIDS questionnaire, uh, which I now refer to as the HMQ, the Horowitz MSIDS questionnaire, um, the recent one that we published in my new book, How Can I Get Better?, we have updated screening criteria where 63 or over is now uh, two standard deviations above the mean, statistically significant um, that people have Lyme. And if OBGYNs were simply to give out this questionnaire in the waiting room for women who either want to get pregnant or are pregnant, they'd be able to see if they score high in the questionnaire, at least in the 40s, 50s, or 60s, that they should be doing tick-borne testing focusing mainly on the fact that this is a disease where the symptoms come and go. There are good and bad days. Um, women will generally say around their menstrual cycle, they get much worse when the estradiol drops off. They have migratory pain that moves around the body. There's some very classical symptoms, including getting uh, either better or worse with antibiotics. So 
it's very important for people to screen um, in pregnancy to make sure that we don't pass it on. It is also in the blood supply, not specifically Lyme disease. We know that Lyme can be in the blood supply, but it's never been proven that it can be transmitted. But relapsing fever um, can be transmitted by blood. This has been proven by Peter Krauss. We know that Babesia is in the blood supply. Four out of a thousand blood transmissions in the United States now contain Babesiosis. So if your hospital is not using Red Cross green blood, you can transmit Babesia to a patient. So if they're immune deficient, either very young or very old, they could die theoretically from Babesiosis. Uh, Bartonella is in the blood supply, so is Anaplasma. So the blood supply, pregnancy, Sexual transmission has been debated. Um, Ray Stricker and Maureen Middleveen have certainly published in the literature that we have found small numbers of spirochetes in both sperm and vaginal secretions, but the problem is it's only a few spirochetes. We know generally with most transmitted diseases, we need high levels of these organisms to be transmitted. For example, you don't just get strep throat by having one or two strep on your tonsils. You need large amounts. And we look epidemiologically when Lyme is transmitted, we know that it peaks in the spring, summer, and fall, but there are no peaks in the winter time. And we would expect if it was sexually transmitted, we would probably be seeing much higher levels in the winter time. That being said, I believe there probably is an occasional case of transmitted sexually, um, but I don't think it's going to be common. I think most of it's going to be tick-borne uh, the way we get it. And as far as the other insects, it's been shown to be present in mosquitoes, um, we know that, for example, Bartonella can be transmitted through ticks, through mites, through spiders, um, through lice. There's many other forms of transmission. Um, but for Lyme, we've never absolutely proven these other forms of transmission, but they have found them in the insects. So I, I think for the most part, the most preventative practices that people need to look at is definitely ticks, which means that now in the springtime, as the ticks are coming out, we definitely should be using preventative measures like permethrin sprays on the clothing, which will kill ticks. You take the clothing outside, it repels the ticks for one to two weeks. Um, and then there are sprays like IR3535 made by Avon Skin So Soft. This has been proven to be effective and safe even in pregnancy. It was published in Europe years ago. And you've got picoridin sprays that also can be found in most of the hardware stores. These will repel the ticks, they will not kill them. So when you go outside, it's good to spray the clothes. It's good to use Picoridin or IR3535, do tick checks, because I just reported today on Facebook, we just had a recent case of Powassan encephalitis um, in New York State. And this tick-borne infection can be transmitted in as little as 15 minutes of a tick bite. Rickettsial infections like Rocky Mountain spotted fever can be transmitted in as little as 10 minutes of a tick bite. And relapsing fever like Borrelia hermsii can be transmitted in as little as five minutes of a tick bite, even can be transmitted through tick feces exposure. So tick prevention is definitely the most important preventative measure. Most of these sprays uh, will also help with uh, viral infections that are in mosquitoes like West Nile. So very, very important at this point in time, I think, to look at those preventative measures. It's really the best way we're gonna prevent getting Lyme disease uh, because once you get into the chronic state, it's obviously much more difficult to treat. That's very, very helpful. Let, let's talk a little bit about the pregnancy piece that you mentioned. It's obvious that Lyme and co-infections have a significant uh, impact on both the mother and the unborn child. So when you're treating the mother during the pregnancy for Lyme and co-infections, does it significantly reduce the risk of transmission to the child? Yeah, so the 100 plus women in my practice that I've treated at this point for tick-borne while they were pregnant, um, we use category, they used to be called category B pregnancy. Now they're, they're using a different nomenclature, but we basically use drugs like cephalosporins, like ceftin um, or Omnicef, which have been shown to be safe in pregnancy. And we will occasionally use Zithromax or Zithromycin. Uh, the thing about Zithromax though, is although it's safe in pregnancy, it does not get into the placenta. So it's really more useful for the pregnant woman than it is for the child. So these drugs are safe in pregnancy. We've used them in over 100 women. All the women had safe and healthy pregnancies. What I will tell you though, there are a handful of women who did still test positive with Borrelia PCRs um, on the cord blood or the placenta. And we recently had a woman who was positive for mycoplasma species uh, in the amniotic fluid, although she took Zithromax for nine months during her pregnancy. And what's a little bit um, worrisome about this and not surprising because I've seen positive mycoplasma PCRs after using 
multiple different intracellular drugs like tetracyclines, macrolides, quinolones. Uh, we did a study years ago where 13% of our patients tested positive in a retrospective study for mycoplasma fermentans. Uh, but this was the first pregnancy case that I've seen. But we know that Zithromax is helpful, but may not be completely curative. So I would say to women who are looking to get pregnant, um, you can use penicillins and cephalosporins in pregnancy. Um, even though we have found a handful of cases where the PCRs were positive, we had doctors like Dr. Jones follow these children longer term in childhood, and they were completely healthy. So that would really be the best advice is speak to your primary care doctor and your OBGYN about using drugs that have been proven to be safe like cephalosporins and macrolides like azithromycin. And it sounds like for someone that's either still dealing with Lyme or still has some symptoms that come and go, even if they've been somewhat successfully treated, that being on antibiotics throughout the pregnancy is probably the, the best way to minimize the risk of transmission to the child. Is that, is that reasonable? Yes, I, I would say that's true. And the, the one thing you just need to make sure is, is that, and this is, of course, with all patients on longer-term antibiotics, is that they're on very strict sugar-free, yeast-free diets. We use a combination of at least three different probiotics, um, over 200 to 300 billion. So we use combinations like Theralac, Ultraflora, Saccharomyces boulardii, um, VSL-3, ProBiomax, um, Orthobiotic. We'll use a whole host of different probiotics especially using Saccharomyces boulardii, which is the healthy yeast that helps stop Clostridium difficile diarrhea. And we have found as long as women um, take these antibiotics with these kind of probiotics during pregnancy, we've not seen long-term complications. And we see very, very few cases in our practice of, of any complications using the antibiotics with the microbiome of the gut while using very, very high dose probiotics. Very good. Yeah, that's such an important topic. So that's good to hear that there are ways to have uh, pregnancies and minimize the risk and have a healthy child. So thank you for that. Let's talk a little bit about testing for Lyme disease and co-infections. What right now are kind of the primary tests that you're using to evaluate Lyme and co-infections? And then are there certain ones that you also use to kind of track progress of treatment? And maybe a few thoughts on why is it still so hard to get accurate testing for Lyme disease and co-infections? Sure. So the Regarding the first question of testing for Lyme, um, I found, as most of us have found who've been doing this for a long time, that the ELISA test is not a very reliable test. So I found in the last several years that using the C6 ELISA uh, as initial screening test with a Western blot from Igenix using an IgM and IgG Western blot uh, is usually the first set of testing we will do for patients if we want to find out if they have active Lyme. Um, and the C6 ELISA, the reason it's a better test is because it will check for other Borrelia species, such as Borrelia afzelii, which is responsible for acrodermatitis chronica metrophicans in Europe, um, and Borrelia garinii, which causes neuroborreliosis in Europe. And even though we don't have a lot of these European strains in the United States, although we've occasionally found them, um, the C6 ELISA definitely is a much better test. So if an ELISA is negative, we usually will immediately do a C6, but I don't even do the ELISA first line anymore. But I've seen cases where the C6 is positive, the ELISA is negative, or vice versa. The ELISA is positive, the C6 is negative. So what I describe in my new book, How Can I Get Better, is a panel approach. We usually start with the C6 and an IgM, IgG through Igenix. And again, the reason for Igenix is there are a whole hundred different strains in the United States. Not all of them are pathogenic, but the Igenix uses the 297 strain from Connecticut, as well as the B31 strain. And by using these two strains, we see more Borrelia-specific bands show up on the Western blot. So the most important thing that people need to know about when being evaluated for Lyme is you're looking for Borrelia-specific bands. Um, and I call this game with the patients looking for these bands Lyme bingo, meaning that if you have any one of the following five bands, bingo, you have been exposed to a Borrelia species, not just Lyme, but other Borrelia. And that would include the 23, the outer surface protein C, the 31, the outer surface protein A, the 34, the outer surface protein B, the 39, which is highly specific, and the 8393. The only time you're gonna see a false positive 31 is if years ago someone had the Lymerix vaccine, which by now the uh, immunity should have worn off, Rarely you will see autoimmune disease or Epstein-Barr virus give you a false positive 31. Um, Igenex has a 31 epitope test that you can use to see if it's truly from Lyme or, for example, from a viral infection or from autoimmunity. Um, so that is an initial screening test we found to be very useful. 
But there are other tests, for example, PCR testing. But again, the Lyme doesn't really hang out in the blood or serum very often. It's more in the tissues and collagen. So we usually need multiple PCR tests to get back a positive. Um, we are looking at TGen laboratories in the next couple of years that will be doing a fish test, an RNA test, um, for finding Lyme, all of the different species. And they'll also be doing it for Babesia, Bartonella, Mycoplasma, all the species. And the reason they're going to stand probably a better chance of picking it up is because right now, if you look at the amount of DNA versus RNA in the cells, um, there are many more ribosomes than there are um, in these patients. So really what we're looking at over time is we're looking at um, using the ribosomal RNA for which there's a lot more at this point in time. Um, so we're probably going to get much more sensitive testing using fish, but right now they've got the line seek 2.0. It's going to be a couple of years until that test is available. So in the meantime, you can still do several sets of PCRs. It could be blood serum, um, urine, spinal fluid. But again, the yield, for example, in spinal fluid is very low. It's about 7%. And a lot of times it's because Lyme is found in immune complexes uh, in the central nervous system, in the serum. It's going dormant, it's in biofilms, it's in cystic forms, it's hiding deep inside the cells. Uh, the Borrelia change their outer surface proteins so it knows how to avoid the immune system. So we need a panel approach. So that means you're going to do cultures, PCRs. You can do a Lyme dot blot. Um, thrygenics, which can be used both in blood serum and spinal fluid. Um, I'm very interested in the Spire test that's going to be coming out uh, hopefully through Columbia University in the next couple of years, which is looking at inflammatory chemokines such as CXCL9, CXCL10, and CCL19. Uh, John Alcott from Hopkins has shown that CCL19 looks like a good marker for chronic Lyme. And this is a test that will maybe be able to be used in early Lyme before antibodies are produced. So we know that we can cure Lyme in the early stages of the disease in at least 20 to 25 percent of the patients. But because it takes weeks before you can get antibodies produced, the Spira test looking at things like CXCL19 uh, will be a very useful test added to our armamentarium in the next couple of years uh, to be able to do testing. And then there's things like the Ellie spot, the lymphocyte transformation test, um, also, which has certainly been helpful for a certain number of patients um, in the United States and in Europe. Um, there's also other tests like the OSPE urine test through George Washington University. Um, so there, there are many other tests. And what I suggest to providers is mainly to first know, of course, that it's a clinical diagnosis. If people score over 63 on the HMQ, the horowitz msitz questionnaire, which was validated in 1,600 people, and we're submitting this to the medical journals this year, it should be out in a publication this year. If you score high in the questionnaire and you have a significant score and you again have good and bad days, symptoms coming and going, migratory pain, which we found in this uh, HMQ, by the way, that in 90% of the patients with Lyme, they had migratory pain as opposed to 50%, kind of a coin flip um, in patients who did not. It was a very highly significant um, symptom for people with Lyme. And interestingly enough, if you go back 40 years through Alan Steer studies, he described migratory pain in the early medical literature and people just ignored it, but it was an important clinical symptom. And it helps differentiate people from things like chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia, where you have fatigue, you have muscle and joint pain, you have sleep disorders, you have memory problems, you get autonomic nervous system dysfunction, but there's no test for chronic fatigue or fibro. It's a clinical diagnosis. These hallmark symptoms of Lyme with a high score in the questionnaire and or Borrelia specific bands means you can kind of go more it's toward diagnosis of Lyme. And it's the same thing if you have somebody with an unexplained autoimmune disease like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, where you may have a positive rheumatoid factor, but their CCP, the specific marker for rheumatoid arthritis is negative, or they have a positive anti-nuclear antibody, but their double-stranded DNA is negative, which is the specific marker for lupus in 95% of the cases. So looking at the questionnaire, looking at the Borrelia specific bands, doing a panel approach with a C6, testing through hygienics, Lyme dot blots, PCRs, culture, lymphocyte transformation tests, you basically got to use a panel approach in most of these people to pick it up. And it's a little bit easier with some of the other tick-borne infections. But for example, um, with Borrelia miyamotoi, um, which is the relapsing fever Borrelia, the ELISA and the Western blot for Lyme will not pick it up. So we've got a real problem here because 
Um, the relapsing fever Borrelia looks like Lyme. It can cause erythema migrans rashes. It can cause joint pain. It can cause a Bell's palsy and a meningi meningitis or a meningoencephalitis. And yet your testing for Lyme is negative. And right now, like in New York State, we only have PCR that we can use for Borrelia miyamotoi. We don't have the antibody testing, which is available in other states like Imogen. So, um, and we have Igenix Laboratories that now does a relapsing fever panel. So it's very important to use Dr. Lee's lab in Connecticut or an IGNX relapsing fever panel. You can still do a Borrelia hermside through Quest, LabCorp, or BioReference to see if you've been exposed to other relapsing fever. And Ehrlichia anaplasma, IgM, IgG, most of the local labs are fine for that. Uh, Bartonella, problematic. You can look through the local labs, but we do find that Bioreference Laboratories is usually better than Quest and LabCorp for finding Bartonella hensilae. And you can use a VEGF, a vascular endothelial growth factor, to look for it. But clearly, Galaxy Labs um, and using a Bartonella fish test from Igenix with a PCR, we have found patients who've been negative on antibodies and PCRs who are positive on Bartonella fish or policy, uh, positive on Galaxy. So again, you're looking at a panel approach using different laboratories, um, Igenix, Galaxy, local labs, trying to find Bartonella species, of which there are 17 or 18 different pathogenic species causing problems in humans. For Rocky Mountain spotted fever, uh, Q fever, Coxiella burnetti, and typhus, most of the local labs are fine with antibody testing. Um, same thing for brucella. You can generally do brucella IgM IgG. You want to do an agglutination test if you suspect true brucella, if the antibodies are positive, because uh, you can get false positive brucella. And for tularemia, we suggest also doing tularemia titers in patients because we similarly have seen quite a bit of tularemia as well as brucella show up in some of these patients that you would not have expected to be exposed to many of these different tick-borne infections. Those are probably the most important tests. For Babesia, we will use the Microti and WA-1 through local tests, uh, LabCorp, Quest, um, BioReference. We just got the WA-1 antibodies back through the local laboratories, but we still find that the Babesia fish test, the, the RNA test, is for us the most reliable for finding active Babesiosis, looking at the HMQ and seeing whether people have unexplained day sweats, night sweats, chills, flushing, air hunger, shortness of breath you can't explain with a cough. So again, you're looking at the clinical symptoms, just like with Bartonella, you may have unexplained seizures, um, severe neuropathy and encephalopathy, um, very bad joint pain that you can't explain, where you're going to have to look at looking at Bartonella species for an overlap for Lyme. So that's kind of gives you an idea how to do this. And again, to let people know, because you have to listen to this podcast multiple times to get this. All of what I just told you is in my new book, How Can I Get Better? In one of the chapters I laid out in the testing, all of the different ways to look at these panel approaches, the laboratories you're going to use, and I give people a step-by-step -step plan um, of how to do the testing and interpret it. Do you use C4A at all for tracking inflammation and progress of treatment overall or no? I do. Um, I mean, again, C4A is not specific. We'll, we'll get it with mold toxins. We'll get it with Lyme. Um, but I do use C4A, just like I'll use TGF-beta-1, which we'll again find with mold. Um, I will use CRPs and SED rates, which you don't find in a lot of Lyme patients, but you will occasionally see that type of inflammatory response in the patients. Um, so yes, I will use it just like rarely people will come in with CD57 tests. But what I explain to people is you can use the CD57, but again, it's not a specific marker. You can get it with autoimmune disease. You can get it with HIV. You can get it with mercury toxicity. And that is why a lot of the infectious disease doctors choose not to use the CD57 as a primary screening test. But certainly for following patients, when you know they have the disease, you can use those type of markers to follow inflammation. But again, I'm a clinician. I take histories from patients, and when they come into my office, I simply ask them, you know, if, if you described last month you were at 50% of normal with severe joint pain, severe fatigue, you know, and now they come in and go, Doc, I'm at 75%. It went from severe to mild fatigue. I follow, you know, clinical symptoms in patients, but yes, I will follow inflammatory markers also as an adjunct to follow many of these patients. Very good. Thank you. 
So looking at Lyme and co-infections, um, and you alluded to Bartonella and Babesia potentially being the answer to this already, but which of the Lyme and co-infections would you suggest are the more symptom producing for patients and also potentially the more challenging to address from a treatment perspective? And then maybe some comments on how you do approach treatment of those specific microorganisms. Yeah, so definitely Babesia, Bartonella, and Mycoplasma, I would say, are probably the most um, resistant ones, although I will tell you also that Tularemia and Brucella are also persisters. So again, um, when I wrote this new book, I discussed now these other bugs, these bacteria being persister bacteria. So we know that Babesia is a persister parasite. Um, it's been shown in the medical literature that Babesia can persist. It affects your immune system's ability to clear other parasites. So we find Babesia to be extremely challenging. If we follow the level of night sweats, day sweats, chills, and flushing in patients, we find that when they take treatments like clindamycin with Mepron and Zithromax, with or without Bactrim and Artemisia and Cryptolepis, that the sweats will go down, but you kind of know how you're dealing with the load of the parasites based on how often do you get the sweats? Has the severity of the sweats or flushing or chills gotten better? Has the cough and the air hunger got better? Um, so you're gonna follow the symptomatology for many of these patients, but we find that, for example, when we stop the treatments for Babesia, we will still find positive PCRs and fish testing in Babesiosis um, in many of these different patients. For Bartonella, we find exactly the same thing. Bartonella is a persister bacteria. So is mycoplasma. So are tularemia and brucella. So is Q fever. Um, so we have many of these associated tick-borne bacterial infections that are intracellular. And these intracellular bacteria are clearly where I believe that most of the bacteria are hiding that are causing the greatest inflammatory response. So we've got to open up the biofilms you know, using things like serapeptase, which hits both production and biofilms that have already been created, using stevia extracted at least 15 drops twice a day, using monolaur and alorcide and coconut oil extract at least a scoop a day, because that's been published in the literature uh, to hit biofilms and also the different forms of Borrelia, just like Eva Shapi did the study on stevia uh, showing the same thing. Uh, the biocidin protocol, which should be published this year through the University of Finland, opens up biofilms, hits different forms of Borrelia, also lowers parasites in the gut with Candida, as does Lorcidin hit Candida. So we find that we've got to open up the biofilms to get these antibiotics in the intracellular compartment. We're always using plaquenil hydroxychloroquine to alkalize the intracellular compartment because just as Morin found years ago with chronic Q fever, that when you gave hydroxychloroquine and alkalized the intracellular compartment, drugs like doxycycline and rifampin would work much better for these intracellular persister bacteria. So what we're doing at this point to treat Bartonella, to treat chronic mycoplasma, to treat chronic tularemia um, and brucellosis and Q fever is we're using combinations of intracellular antibiotics and some of the most common ones, which again, I've got all of these protocols laid out in the book, the most common these days that I'm using is doxycycline, rifampin, and dapsone. And as you probably know, I published the first oral persister protocol for Lyme disease last year in the medical literature. We had 100 people, which we did in a pilot study, using doxycycline, rifampin, and dapsone. And we found that this was statistically significant in lowering down fatigue, pain, uh, day sweats, night sweats, and chills for Babesia, neuropathy, sleep disorders. It improved memory and concentration. The only thing that didn't improve in that first Dapsone study was um, headaches. We recently did a second study, which we'll be publishing this year, in 200 patients on Dapsone. And we did this thanks to a generous grant from the um, Bay Area Lyme Foundation. And we did a data mining on 200 patients where we found a lot of useful information because we actually data mined the entire MSIDS model to find out not only what these patients respond to, but what were the factors on the MSIDS map that were keeping them ill. And we're still on, it's an ongoing data mining project, but we found in this study, it was statistically significant, even better than the first study, and even headaches got better in the second study. So triple intracellulars, like doxy, rifampin, dapsone, doxy, rifampin, bactrim, doxy, rifampin, dapsone, zithromax, 
um, sometimes for intracellular drugs, but usually using a persister drug. And we also published last year on another persister protocol for Lyme and autoimmune disease, um, as well as co-infections, which was pyrazinamide, which is again a tuberculosis drug, um, similar to what Dapsone is in the literature for mycobacterium species, we found that pyrazinamide was useful um, in people who had, for example, Bartonella and tularemia, where we found that doxycycline, rifampin, moxifloxacin, which is a quinolone, avalox with pyrazinamide, um, lowered tularemia titers from 1 to 320 to 1 to 20 in an immunosuppressed patient who had Lyme um, with co-infections like Bartonella, which relapsed during the treatment, who also had a bad case of tularemia. So I think the key at this point is looking at persister drugs, which I borrowed from the mycobacterium literature. Uh, Dr. Zahm from Hopkins certainly has showed a lot of drugs that have persister potential, but the problem with the daptomycin study that he published um, a couple of years ago is number one, it's IV. It's $10,000 for a one month supply of daptomycin with rocephin and doxycycline. And I gave it to a set of patients and I found that it was not curative. All it did was hurt them. So in the middle of a worldwide epidemic, we have to find cheap, easily available drugs that can be used for millions of people to cure them from this. And these mycobacterium drugs using these kind of persister protocols that I describe in detail in my new book, we find with using biofilm protocols and even pulse protocols, which I borrowed from Kim Lewis from Northeastern, we're finding that we can use pulse protocols like pulse cephalosporins, which is what Kim Lewis did in his studies. Um, and we're finding that people get better and the advantage of pulsing is there's less of an effect on the microbiome of the gut. And the beauty of Dapsone is Dapsone does not seem to have any effect on the microbiome of the, of the gut as far as we can see. So these are all persisters, Babesia bartonella being the worst ones. But when you look at Dapsone and you combine it with doxyrifampin, Dapsone hits Babesia. So if you were to do doxy with Dapsone, with rifampin, um, with malarone, with artemisia, you're going to hit Lyme, Babesia, and Bartonella at the same point. And the key for me with these type of treatment regimens that we do at the Hudson Valley Healing Arts Center is we try and address as many of the co-infections with Lyme at the same point in time. I usually describe it as uh, multiple ninjas attacking your fort. You know, if you've got all of these different bacteria which are causing inflammation in the body, you can't simply go after one of them because otherwise you're not going to be able to adequately decrease the inflammatory response. Very, very good. I, I want to come back to Dapsone, but while we were talking about Bartonella, some of the folks on Facebook that I mentioned that we were going to be having this conversation and they had a few questions and there was an interesting one about Bartonella and lipomas. And I've heard about nodules sometimes in the upper legs that come from Bartonella. People refer to them more as lipomas, but how common are these lipomas or nodules with Bartonella and then do they generally resolve with Bartonella treatment or is there something specific that has to be done in people that have these these lipomas or nodules? Yeah, so I see the, the nodular granulomas because uh, we know that Bartonella causes granulomas in different parts of the body. Different Bartonella species will do this. The ones that I've seen most commonly are Bartonella granulomas, which are over um, the fingers. You can see them on the elbows, different parts of the body. Um, in the people that I've treated with Bartonella who had these granu granulomas, and this was actually the case study that I published last year um, in a, an arthritis journal, the granulomas went away when doxyrifampin and pyrazinamide was added to the regimen. It was actually pyrazinamide that turned out to be one of the most effective protocols for this woman with a very severe autoimmune disease, uh, besets with a rheumatoid arthritis overlap who had Bartonella uh, that was silent. She actually had negative Bartonella testing, and then she relapsed during the course where her Bartonella titers turned positive, her VGF went up, and we gave her pyrazinamide and the granulomas got much better. Um, we, we do see lipomas all the time, but I'm not aware that they are always um, caused by Bartonella. And I've not seen anything that has convinced me in the medical literature that it's causing lipomas, but definitely granulomas are there. Uh, although someone may know that there is literature on that topic. Um, so, so I think the granulomas are probably gonna be the most common one you'll see. And of course the skin rashes with Bartonella, which can be in the skin planes or transverse to the skin planes, those are, of course, one of the most common skin manifestations we'd see with Bartonella all the time. 
So with skin manifestations of Bartonella, we see striae or stria. They look like stretch marks. Um, if Bartonella has been successfully treated, do those entirely resolve or can the treatment be successful and still have longer term uh, stretch marks that look like skin you know, stretch marks? Is that something that will persist? What we usually see is that the stretch marks don't necessarily go away, but they usually get smaller over time and they lighten up. So the ones who come in with very red uh, kind of inflamed stretch marks, you'll actually see the color of them change and they start to shrink over time as you treat the patients for Lyme and Bartonella. Very good. Thank you. So talking about Dapsone and some of the persister protocols that you mentioned, it sounds like now this entire protocol can be done with oral antibiotics, that there's not an IV piece of this. Is that correct? Yes. Now, it, it doesn't mean I never use IV. Of course I do, but I actually use very little IV treatment in my practice at this point. The main advantage that I found from Dapsome, um, apart from the fact that the literature clearly from Kim Lewis and John Hopkins has shown that these bacteria are persister bacteria. And, you know, the light bulb that went off in my head years ago is everyone knew that Lyme persisted. Um, who's ever looked at the medical literature? I mean, there's, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 articles on the subject over the last couple of decades. So we know that, but I did not associate it with being a persister bacteria like tuberculosis. And that's what made me go to the medical literature and look at, well, what are the persister drugs we use for other persister bacteria like leprosy and tuberculosis? That's where I got the idea of using pyrazinamide and dapsone, which again, we're having very good success. Dapsone gets very good penetration into the central nervous system. We have people that we never have to put on IV therapy who've gone on Dapsone. The problem with Dapsone is that about a third of the people can't tolerate the drug because they have side effects. And the side effects of Dapsone, I refer to as do no harm. H is for Herxheimer reactions. A is for anemia. R is for rashes. And M is for methemoglobinemia. So people can have very severe Herxheimer reactions with Dapsone. I think in the data mining study we just did, it was at least two thirds of the patients had very severe reactions. One way you can get around it is sometimes pulsing the Dapsone. Um, I had a woman yesterday who's been sick for years who just came in um, just yesterday who said, um, I'm doing 10 days on of 100 milligrams of Dapsone four days off. And I get through the Herxes because the Herxes go away four days off. I stay on my folic acid um, and I've gone, you know, improving like 20% in the last month and a half, which for her was absolutely enormous. She's one of these very resistant patients. Nothing gets her better. We finally found that, that pulsing the Dapsone because she can't tolerate regular drugs um, was the answer for her. So I think people need to understand that there are ways of using lower dose Dapsone and working it up. Um, to get rid of the Herxes using high amounts of N-acetylcysteine, alpha-lipoic acid, and glutathione, which will help with the Herxes. You can use things like the BLT formula from Research Nutritionals, which contains red root, bone set, and Smilax or Saparilla to help with the Herxheimers. Um, you can open up the detox pathways using phase one, phase two products uh, like broccoli compounds, methane for phase one, um, uh, broccoli seed extracts like gluc uh, uh, glucoraphanin, sulforaphane for phase two. Um, there are many different products, uh, drainage remedies. You've got to use all of those products with Dapsone because the Herxes are so bad. Um, the anemia can be controlled by using high doses of folic acid, a minimum of anywhere between 15 to 25 to 30 milligrams twice a day. We usually control the anemia so it doesn't drop below three grams of hemoglobin. But women can't start this if they have a hemoglobin that's not above 12 um, because they, if they have iron deficiency anemia, very difficult for these women, although it reverses when you stop the drug and give them lots of folic acid. The rashes, even though people can have rashes on uh, sulfur drugs, like they can take Bactrim and have a rash, we find that very few patients with Dapsone, I think it's maybe um, one or two percent of the people might get a rash on it. Um, and we'll use like an H1, H2 blocker like Zyrtec, Zantac, if there's any question of mild rashes with Bactrim. Although if it's a severe rash, like a, a severe Stevens-Johnson, you would never consider using the drug. Um, and finally, with methemoglobin, which is where you lose the oxygen carrying capacity of your blood because it oxidizes your hemoglobin, um, high dose glutathione, again, helps with that because that's how you reverse methemoglobinemia. So we find by using these tricks of do no harm, we can get most of these people through the Dapsone protocol. And we found, for example, in my first book, Why Can't I Get Better? 
I was saying probably 90 to 92 percent of the patients would get better with the 16 point MSIDS model before I was ever using persister drugs or regularly using biofilm busters. In this last version of how can I get better, that 8% of the people that I couldn't get better, let's say in the first book, probably two thirds of those patients are now improving with these persister protocols. So there's a lot of hope for people who've been sick for a very long time. Um, we finally got the funds for a prospective study from Dapsone. Um, I was the keynote speaker at the Live Lime Gala in Denver, Colorado, just this past weekend. They raised over um, a half a million dollars. Uh, Olivia Goodrow, who's a 12 year old, she raised the money. She formed her own foundation. I got to meet with the Lieutenant Governor of Colorado, the governor's wife, the state senators. Um, and I think we have a very good program and it looks like they will be happy to help fund a prospective study. We have another foundation, um, the Bill and Marion Cook Foundation that are interested. So we're speaking to multiple foundations to fund a prospective multi-center study with Dapsone. So that hopefully we'll be able to start this by the end of the year. And finally, we'll get this published in the literature so that the insurance companies and many of these infectious disease doctors who do not believe that Lyme is a chronic persistent infection or that co-infections are playing a big role, we will finally have a good prospective study using persister drugs. And we'll be able to show that we do have effective protocols, which will be covered by insurance. You are definitely changing the world in a big way. Uh, this is really exciting. So on the Dapsone regimens that you do, approximately how long is someone on that regimen? And then do we know once they stop, is there some recurrence of symptoms over a long period of time? Is it too early to know that? Do they still need to be on any kind of maintenance antimicrobials? What's that looking like? So initially when I started doing the Dapsone protocol, you know, we stopped at uh, two to three months, people relapsed. We stopped at four months, they relapsed. We stopped at six months, they relapsed. So when we looked, we then went back to the leprosy literature and said, gee, for leprosy, mycobacterium leprae, a persister bacteria, intracellular, slow growing, difficult to kill, they use at least a year of rifampin and dapsone. So we basically extended the protocol at this point to at least a year for most people. And most of the time we're doing it with doxycycline because um, we got also Eva Shoppy some grant monies through a foundation that I helped open up years ago with a friend of mine, David Turek, called the Lyme Navigator Foundation. And we had Eva do studies in culture, and she found that doxycycline, rifampin, and dapsone was in fact the most effective protocol in culture. It lowered biofilm forms of Lyme, which are the most resistant forms apart from the cystic forms. Um, these ones in biofilms are very difficult to kill. They're dormant, they're not active, and those are some of the ones that uh, caused the relapses apart from cystic forms. So we found that it was the most effective in 72 hours, 50% of the biofilm colonies were killed in 72 hours at the highest doses of these. So we now have people doing it for a year. Do I think it's curative? Absolutely not. But for example, if you haven't had Lyme too long and don't have multiple co-infections, you're obviously gonna get a better clinical response. Um, I recently had a woman who was sick from three years old to 53. She's had it for 50 years. She was with me for years. She did a year of the Dapsone at the full dose. She stopped. At about three to four weeks out, she started relapsing just very slightly, although nothing like what the relapses had been from prior regimens. So the answer is, is I don't know the full dosage of the drugs yet, but I suspect it's probably going to be full dose doxy, like 200 milligrams twice a day, full dose rifampin, 300 BID. We've also find sometimes that double dose rifampin pulsed may do a better job for some of these people. We're also looking at rifibutin at this point. Um, we know that the highest dose of Dapsone, 100 milligrams, is the most effective, um, and 50 milligrams is an absolute minimum for people. But we, we see at this point, we still see relapses but we see a much higher quality of life. And in a lot of these people, although usually I would put them on, for example, the Cowden protocol with cementobandrol or traditional Chinese herbs like Coptus hudiana or the Byron White protocol, um, in a lot of these patients, we haven't given them any herbs when they stop the treatment because I'm interested to see what their baseline is. And a lot of these people are doing well, but obviously I have seen relapses, but some of them have not just been from Lyme. I've seen positive Bartonella fish testing in some of these people. I've seen positive uh, Babesia fish testing. So the problem I'm still facing 
is it's not just Lyme, it's clearly Babesia bartonella. We're not always doing the mycoplasma PCRs and I know already it's, it's been a persister. So we're making great headway. I'm seeing a lot of people get better. I do have certain pa- people on the regimen for longer. Uh, one woman who had two PCR positives on knee taps um, over several years, she is now going into a two-year Dapsone protocol because she failed uh, many different prior regimens, including IV Rocephin, where her knee taps were positive by PCR, um, and she is now asymptomatic. So for her case, we put her out to 24 months, and she's about to stop the protocol. So I keep having to push it out in some people, um, but the good news is, is that if you don't have a lot of overlapping co-infections or don't have a lot of overlapping inflammatory things on the MSIDS map, you're not going to have the same kind of relapse. But remember, I'm not putting people on a lot of herbs when they stop. It's possible if I were to put people on herbs, which usually work in about 70% of the people in my practice, um, we wouldn't even see that many relapses. But I, I don't want to do herbs at this point after the Dapsone protocol because I want to get a baseline as far as what's actually happening in these people. Having done this for 30 years at this point, Um, I think it's definitely a protocol that people, if they failed classical regimens, uh, this is definitely a protocol that people want to look at. Um, The next step really is getting money to all of our researchers to do multiple combinations in culture. And this is what uh, we're looking at for Dr. Zhang from Hopkins, from um, Stanford University, from Dr. J, looking at uh, Dr. Shapi. All of these researchers now need monies from the foundations to take multiple combinations of these drugs and cultures and tell us which combinations are best. But as I explained to Dr. Zhang a couple of weeks ago, um, you've really got to be looking at co-infections. You can't just do Borrelia in culture because these people who are chronically ill have Lyme MSIDs. They have Lyme with multiple co-infections with other overlapping causes of inflammation. So you're only going to get a partial picture if you just look at Borrelia in culture when you're evaluating these protocols. Yeah, absolutely. And this has been a great, uh, you know, kind of status update on where you are with Lyme and co-infections. And let's kind of branch out a little bit and maybe just get a few comments on some other areas that people potentially need to explore and how often you see these in your practice. So how often is mold in the home or work environment something that your patients have to deal with to move themselves forward? Uh, We're seeing approximately two-thirds of our patients. The first 100 people we tested for mold toxins from real-time labs in Texas, about two-thirds of them, I think it was actually 66 out of 100, um, had mold toxins. So we are finding mold toxins in a large number of people, aflatoxins, trichothecenes. Lately, we've been finding gliotoxins, which is immunosuppressive. Um, which is very difficult because Lyme suppresses the immune system. Uh, Bartonella has immunosuppressive properties. We know that a lot of people with Lyme have chronic variable immune deficiency with low immunoglobulins and subclasses. We know that Babesia suppresses the immune system and the ability to get rid of parasites. So once you throw mold toxins on top of it, and mercury we're finding in a lot of people uh, that also has autoimmune reactions in the body, it acts as a haptin on the outsides of cells. It Uh, creates problems with autoimmunity. We do see problems with these toxins um, affecting patients. So the more difficult question to ask is when I treat these people using oral phosphatidylcholine, three grams twice a day, um, oral liposomal glutathione, 500 milligrams twice a day with the the, uh, liposomal uh, phosphatidylcholine, toxin binders, whether it's clay, charcoal, um, well call, which I use quite a bit of, Um, or cholestyramine, we're pulling the mold toxins out without ever doing IV phosphatidylcholine or IV alpha lipoic acid. Um, We are using NAC, Alamax orally, all of these things orally, it's pulling the toxins out. In my clinical experience, there's certainly a certain percentage of people that get better, but I will still tell you, it is not the largest nail in the foot that I see for people who have Lyme MSIDs. I still find that Lyme and co-infections like Babesia bartonella and intracellular co-infections like mycoplasma, tularemia, brucella, they're still playing a much larger role for keeping these people ill on top of hormone disruption like low adrenals, on top of leaky gut with food allergies, which is causing inflammation. Um, so I'm still finding that other inflammatory things on the MSIDS map with or without mitochondrial dysfunction and especially POTS dysautonomia, 
where people are not even tested by some of their physicians for POTS, where their their chronic symptoms of dizziness, fatigue, palpitations, uh, cognitive issues, anxiety, is not just due to active Lyme, but it's due to the fact that their autonomic nervous system has been affected, and they can't hold the blood pressure standing. And once you raise their blood pressure uh, and give them flugicortisone and salt and licorice and midodrine, Northera, uh, beta blockers, these people feel tremendously better. So I do know that detoxing people with glutathione makes 70% of my people feel better. But exactly the role of the mold toxins, I will tell you, it is difficult, at least in my practice, to establish because I see so many overlapping factors keeping these people ill that right now it's difficult for me to say exactly what role it is. So we're treating them. We're getting the toxins out. Uh, we have very inexpensive methods of getting it out. All of the protocols are described in detail in the addendum of my book. Um, but I think time will tell as far as exactly the role of the mold toxins. But the one mold toxin that really uh, I'm really worried about probably the most is the gliotoxins because already you've got immunosuppression with Lyme Bartonella babesia. And to have other things that are suppressing immunity like gliotoxins and, again, mercury and environmental toxins, boy, that's really rough when your immune system is fighting multiple infections. Yeah, and my understanding with gliotoxin is that aspergillus and potentially candida or candida uh, can both produce gliotoxin. In, in the uh, two-thirds of the people that had positive real-time labs tests, did you find that some percentage of them needed to do something to remediate their environment as well, or does that not seem to be a common need? Oh, no, no, absolutely. Uh, remediating the environment is absolutely important because these mold spores can be in the environment. They can get on your clothes. I mean, there are certain environmental doctors that will tell you uh, for people that are really sick with mold. And I do have some people that are very environmentally sensitive. They have, you know, multiple chemical sensitivity, environmental illness. They walk into a room with mold and they're sick within five minutes. So it's not that I don't, you know, see it. I obviously see mold toxins in some people play a big role, but the ones who have the biggest effect on mold are the ones that have the overlapping chemical sensitivity. The ones who are not as chemically sensitive, who have uh, Lyme toxins, uh, for example, with mold, those are the ones that may not be as affected as strongly. But the ones who have chemical sensitivity, those are clearly the ones that you treat the Lyme, they get a little bit better, but the minute they walk into an environment that has mold, they will tell you within several minutes they, they get sick with headaches, um, with brain fog, with fatigue. Those are the ones you know. Those are the ones they've got to do infrared saunas, um, lots of detox. They definitely have to remediate. So, yes, the, the environmental remediation is definitely an important piece. Let's talk a little bit about parasites. So, first, how common are those? Do you treat them? But I'm also interested, you posted an article recently that I'm interested in your thoughts on where – some parasites were found to hide or house these smaller organisms, potentially such as Lyme and other things. And so I'm wondering, do you think that some of the parasites also then serve as reservoirs for these other Lyme and co-infection related organisms within the body itself? We, we do definitely see parasites play a very large role in keeping people ill. Um, I'll give you a great example. There's a there's a young man and um, HIPAA regulations, they, they posted this online. I won't mention his name, but it's been posted online. He's in the Philadelphia area. Um, he's a young man who saw, I forget the number, it was something like 12 doctors, eight neurologists, multiple infectious disease doctors in his 30s in a wheelchair drooling with Parkinson's disease. Um, and nobody could figure out what was wrong with him. It turned out he had Lyme, he had Babesia, he had Bartonella, he had West Nile virus, he had mold toxins, he had mercury. Uh, he had many overlapping factors. The only thing that seemed to get him better over time, we would get up out of the wheelchair and the Parkinson's symptoms got better, was parasite treatment. And just recently, we had given him a second course of parasitic treatment. And for the second time, he got up out of the wheelchair and started walking um, up and down stairs, going outside. Um, and I've seen these kind of cases, like the test case for Babesia, where I first discovered Babesia in Dutchess County about 17 years ago. This patient was paralyzed from the waist down, um, unable to walk, treated for five years with a very good Lyme literate doctor. At that point, no one really knew so much about Babesia. And within 10 days of treating the Babesia with Mepron and Zithromax, she walked out of the wheelchair for the first time. These parasites are playing a huge role in keeping people sick. And we sometimes find that drugs like Alinea and Biltricide and Ivermectin and Albendazole um, and Paramomycin, if they have other uh, bacteria and parasites, 
do play a role in getting these people better. I've seen psychiatric cases or one young man who lives a couple of states away with a Lyme-induced schizophrenia. The only drugs that has gotten him out of his schizophrenia temporarily was Dapsone with anti-parasitic abilities where he herxed. And once he came out of the herx, he started talking normally for the first time in years. The parasites are playing a large role. As far as you know, hiding some of these other bacteria, it's difficult to say exactly how often that really is happening. Um, I think it's conjecture at this point, but I don't think it matters. But as a general rule, absolutely, you need to do CDSAs for some of these people. You need to do good parasite testing. Um, and certainly the Morgellons patients will tell you in some of them that the only thing that makes the Morgellons lesions and their, their burning itching type sensations get better are things like ivermectin um, and antiparasitic protocols, apart from going in the intracellular compartment and using things like uh, Bactrim and Zithromax or quinolones with doxycycline. So definitely parasites are playing a very big role, uh, just as a lot of these chronic intracellular persister bacteria. Let's talk a little bit more about detoxification. You've mentioned glutathione, you've mentioned some other things so far in the discussion, but things like metals and pesticides. I think pesticides is a, a big issue. Chemicals in the environment is a big issue. Um, how do you generally approach that? And then one of the words that I think of when I uh, hear your name is sulforaphane. So maybe you can tell people what is it you love so much about sulforaphane? Right. So sulforaphane is broccoli seed extract. Um, and um, I myself take 100 milligrams twice a day um, of sulforaphane. Uh, it was studied several years ago by Harvard researchers and John Hopkins. They actually tried patenting it, except it was out um, at that point, where they gave it to autistic children in 300 milligrams a day, and two-thirds of the autistic kids, their brains woke up. Uh, the thing about sulforaphane, what's amazing about it, is it's the strongest phase two liver detoxifier. Um, and you need your phase two liver pathways working to get rid of all these environmental toxins. So we're exposed to three to 500 environmental toxins every day, um, pesticides, heavy metals, PCBs, um, dioxins, pesticides. So huge numbers are getting in every day. Um, they will cause breaks in your DNA if you don't have enough glutathione. So you've got to work the liver uh, phase two pathways using things like NAC, alpha lipoic acid to help your body to make glutathione, methylation pathways. But broccoli seed extract will open up phase two pathways. Um, it lowers inflammation. So knowing that inflammation is the number one cause of why people get ill, not just with Lyme, but with other diseases. So when I teach, I tell people that Lyme disease with environmental toxins causes inflammation. Um, same thing with Alzheimer's. We know that we're finding uh, Lyme bacteria in the brains of Alzheimer's patients, just like Borrelia miyamotoi, like chlamydia pneumonia, like Helobacter pylori, um, like Porphyrmanus gingivalis, which is under the biofilms on your teeth, herpes viruses, they're under biofilms. They're finding pesticides in the brains of Alzheimer's disease. So, and this was published in JAMA. So bacteria with viruses, infections, and these environmental toxins are now being left to Alzheimer's. Same thing with autism. They're finding a certain number of autistic cases treated with antibiotics for Lyme are getting them better. Same thing with environmental toxins are getting into the mothers before pregnancy that have been linked up to autism spectrum disorder. Infections and toxins causes inflammation. Same thing with multiple sclerosis. Lyme causes autoimmune phenomenon, as does chlamydia and pneumonia with low vitamin D. Mercury causes autoimmune phenomenon. Infections and toxins causes autoimmunity. It's always the same thing that these environmental toxins combined with the infections are causing problems. So sulforaphane is so important because it's lowering inflammation, which causes fatigue and headaches and joint pain and memory problems and sleep disorders and mood disorders. You've got to lower these inflammatory cytokines. And what curcumin and resveratrol and green tea extract and broccoli seed extract all have in common is they take a molecule inside the cytoplasm of your cells called NRF2 and they translocate it, they move it into the nucleus, hitting a switch inside the nucleus called NF kappa B, which turns on the production of cytokines. And by giving you things like curcumin broccoli seed, you shut down NF kappa B. You do the same thing with glutathione and alpha lipoic acid and antioxidants, lowering inflammation, helping symptoms, 
And broccoli seed extract, it even hits the P53 gene to maybe help with cancer. So considering that my entire family died of cancer, my mother, father, and six aunts and uncles, I'm taking a lot of these type of broccoli compounds like diandole methane and broccoli seed extract while eating an organic diet, uh, keeping pesticides out. And pesticides has been linked up to Parkinson's disease. We have found it in that young man I talked about in the wheelchair. We found it in Parkinsonian patients, very high levels of pesticides. Um, so we have to be careful with what the environmental exposure is and using these type of supplements, considering the number of environmental toxins getting into the body with infections that are driving the inflammatory response. We've got to lower inflammation and we've got to open up those detoxification pathways uh, to lower down inflammation. And that's where we see a large majority uh, of the improvement in our chronically ill people. I'm glad that I asked the question because I knew sulforaphane helped upregulate phase two, but I didn't realize that it was such a strong anti-inflammatory. So that's, that's very, very helpful information. When you test patients for uh, viruses, so you do a viral panel for things like EBV, HHV6, all of these things, it seems like many people do have some reactivation of chronic viruses that have been probably in their system for many, many years. Do you find that then doing something specific to treat them leads the person to higher ground or is that not really an area where treatment leads to a, a higher level of success? I've personally only seen a very small percentage of people ever get better with antiviral therapy. And, and the problem is, is that most of the viral reactivation, when you give drugs like um, Valtrex, valacyclovir, um, it's really more for, you know, some of the herpes viruses, but we don't really see it have a huge effect. Rarely, I will see an effect. I've had patients come in on Valcite um, also, which is used for uh, certain people with viral reactivation. So, you know, Dr. Montoya from Stanford years ago found that if people had HHV6 in the acute phase where they got flu-like symptoms, high HHV6 titers, like at 1 to 640, and he gave them valcite, these people did get better. So there's no doubt that in the literature, some of these viral infections are responsible for uh, chronic fatigue and chronic fatiguing illnesses. But at least in my patient population, um, I don't find the viruses play a large role, although I suspect <laughs> that probably in the uh, the three or four percent of the people that I just can't make a dent in getting them better, there probably are viral infections that are responsible, and we just don't have really great antiviral treatments um, to treat some of these people. So it's not that I never see it play a role. I just don't find that for the majority of the patients, um, it's the main reason why they stay chronically ill. But there's absolutely no doubt that some people do reactivate the viruses. Um, and that you do need to look at the viral infections as to why some of these people may be chronically ill. And you may already be covering some of that with things that you mentioned earlier, like loracidin, for example. I mean, some of those things also have some antiviral properties. So maybe that's a place where bringing in some of the herbs and other things can be helpful for the viruses as well. Yeah, I think where it's going to be interesting in future research is I, I was just approached by um, one of the heads of the uh, drug companies that makes Alinea. And it turns out that um, Alinea actually has antiviral properties as well as helping with C. diff, as well as helping parasites. Um, we're looking at doing a, a pilot study and eventually a prospective study uh, with Alinea, which has antiviral properties. And I think it's an important drug to look at for Lyme. Uh, just because in, in the past, I was one of the first doctors, in fact, I was the first doctor to ever talk about flagell uh, for Lyme disease. This was like 16 years ago. I presented this at, I think it was the 13th International Lyme Conference. And six months later, Dr. Brosson from Norway discovered it hit the cystic forms of Lyme. We know that tinidazole and, and flagell, metronidazole, hit cystic forms. Alinea, uh, you know, would have a similar effect, but it also has an antiviral property. So I will use things like 3,6-beta-glutcan. I use mushroom derivatives that raise up natural killer cells and T cells, which fight viruses. Um, I will use things like olive leaf extract, which have been published in the medical literature for viral infections. But I think it's probably more preventative. I don't think if you've got a really active viral infection, you're probably going to see the, you know, the same effect. Um, but definitely, this is, this is an area that definitely needs to be explored in some of these people that are failing traditional therapies. What about EMF hypersensitivity? Is that a common thing in your practice? And what do you do in those patients that are reactive to electromagnetic fields? Um, in my practice, it's not a common uh, thing that I see. Do I, again, have chemically sensitive people who are EMF sensitive? Absolutely. Uh, I, there are patients in Florida where they put on the smart meters on their homes that all of a sudden got chronically ill. 
um, and they had to call up, you know, Florida Power and tell them to change the smart meters with the EMFs to regular ones. Um, some of these people need to do shielding. They need to actually almost live in Faraday cages with lead. Um, I know Dr. Klinghardt will sometimes take these people to faraway places to be able to uh, stop the EMFs. Again, this is this is a certain percentage of people that are EMF sensitive, um, and it's it's difficult to evaluate at this point because we're all you know bombarded with these radio frequency waves. You know, I personally do try and have. Uh, protection. I have it on my computer. I have it on my phone. Um, I have lead shielding on my phone. Um, I don't put my phone directly to my head. Uh, I did show the study, which was in this last book, How Can I Get Better, that they finally published in mice that they were seeing brain tumors like glioblastoma um, with mice exposed to cell phone radiation. So we're bombarded by these radiation fields all the time. It's, diff it's difficult to evaluate, but what I've seen in the literature is that it will also affect, for example, the tight junctions with leaky gut. So where this is kind of difficult is if you're one of these patients who come into my practice, and this is really common that people have candida leaky gut with food sensitivities, with histamine, sometimes with mast cell activation disorder. Um, if you have leaky gut and you're not getting over it, um, the literature has shown that some of these cases may be due to ongoing EMF sensitivity, which affects the tight junctions just like mercury will affect the tight junctions, less like candida will affect it. Um, so I, I think because we're bombarded by so many different factors that affect the tight junctions in the gut or affecting the cells in the DNA, there's so many factors, it's very difficult to tease out, but you definitely will hear from a certain grouping of people, they get on their phones, they get on their computers, uh, they go into hotel rooms um, where they're exposed to outgassing from chemicals or EMF and they get sick. But again, the ones who are usually gonna have that are the ones who are the most chemically sensitive. So let's talk, you brought up mast cells. So let's talk a little bit about mast cell activation syndrome. Is that, seems to me that it's something people are talking about more, but is that becoming more of a common thing that patients are presenting with in your practice? Um, how do you approach testing for it, if there is even a way to test for it? And then what are some of the substances potentially that are helpful for stabilizing the mast cells? Um, there are defi there's definitely a subgroup of patients in my practice who do have mast cell activation or have true mastocytosis. Um, so, so one of the things that I do clinically, if I want to see how active someone is with histamine, because what's happening with mast cell activation is um, the, the basophils um, and some of these other cells are secreting large amounts of inflammatory mediators, um, which include histamine. So if you were to test for histamine in the blood, 24-hour uh, histamine levels, uh, chromogranin A, tryptase levels, those are some of the most common ones you do with certain prostaglandins, uh, PGT. D2 and others, that'll show you whether you've got um, mast cell activation. If you have someone who says, I have allergic rhinitis, I have asthma, I have eczema, those are usually the people that are going to be the sensitive ones who have a lot of histamine. Um, and people will tell you that they itch after eating certain foods. Um, one way clinically is telling is dermatographism. If you take a fingernail and scratch your initials on a forearm, you can see that Redness with the initial come up literally within seconds for people um, who have a lot of histamine release um, from the cells in the skin. So for example, I have a lot of histamine release. I have leaky gut. I have to avoid dairy. If I avoid dairy and my sensitive foods, I don't need asthma sprays. Um, I, in fact, I hardly ever have to use any asthma medication anymore as long as I'm avoiding histamine foods. Now, there's a sub group of people who have mast cell activation who also have POTS dysautonomia. And those are the ones that have, for example, nausea and vomiting and gastroparesis and very severe GI symptoms where they need gastrochrom, they need chromalin sodium, they need H1, H2 blockers like uh, Zantac and Zyrtec twice a day. Um, they need DAO, they need a uh, diamine oxidase, things that will degrade um, histamine, which, and I've taken DAO, um, the one, uh, it's called Histeo, and if I take it 15 to 30 minutes before eating histamine foods, it will help my body to degrade histamine. So people use things like DAO and methylation cofactors and SAMI and H1, H2 blockers, gastrochrom, uh, chromalin sodium, doing a histamine-free diet, um, getting tested with things like tryptase, histamine, chromogranin A. If you have at least two out of three of those markers, you probably do have a mast cell disorder. And we know that you know histamine is one of those inflammatory mediators 
like just like NF-kappa B will turn on the inflammatory mediators with uh, TNF-alpha, intraleukin-1, intraleukin-6, interferon gamma. Histamine is just one more of those kind of mediators with leukotrienes that you see in asthma and other allergic diseases that are causing an inflammatory reaction in the body. So, you know, that's why you've got to look at where all of these inflammatory molecules are coming from. And clearly, um, there are a grouping of people with resistant migraines, resistant GI dysfunction. My wife is a great example. She was having uh, atypical migraines, which were not responding with very bad GI pain, which we couldn't explain. And once I got her on a histamine-free diet, the migraines went away and all of her stomach pain went away. Uh, these are kind of these hidden things they don't teach you in med school that, you know, when you've been diving and digging for 30 years, trying to figure out why people are chronically ill, you come across mast cell, uh, and certainly in the last couple of years, there's definitely, a, as I said, a fraction of my patients who have it, and they do feel better getting off histamine-releasing foods. Yeah, and unfortunately, a lot of the companies that had products with DAO, it sounds now like there's only one source of DAO in the United States, and that a lot of those other products that are available are just whatever uh, supply they had left, and that um, most of them won't be available anymore except through this one company, is my understanding. And that unfortunately... Is- they are starting to uh, ship DAO again now within the last month, I believe. That's exactly right. Yeah, there, there's only one manufacturer. And, and for me, I was certainly saddened by it because I, I do use DAO uh, when I'm going to be off my diet. Fortunately, I don't have a severe case of it enough that I can be a little bit off my diet and I'm fine. Uh, but people who are severely ill, uh, the DAO is definitely an important adjunct um, to their diet. Yeah. Right. So I've always been an advocate of uh, Lyme not being a self-treatment disease. It is complex. People do need a knowledgeable doctor. But for those people that just cannot access a doctor um, due to finances, due to other factors, are there some things that you think they can do to move their health forward? Are there certain protocols or other things that those people should explore? Yeah, so um, for people that are chronically ill, um, most of those people need antibiotics. It's very difficult to do this with just um, integrative therapies. Although, that being said, there are people who go to some doctors who specialize in integrative medicine, um, who do oxidative therapies with ozone, for example, um, and will use you know many different types of therapies, um, and they do get better. And Again, in my patient population, probably 70% respond to the herbs. The real key for someone that doesn't have access to a regular physician, I would say at least work with a good naturopathic physician um, who's been trained in these type of protocols, who can go through the 16-point MSIDS model and do food allergy testing for you and testing you for leaky gut and you know helping you with things for sleep. Um, So I I think it's still important you can work with a naturopath, and there are many excellent naturopaths who've trained with me in my office and who are out there helping people. In fact, many in Canada, I'm going to uh, Toronto next weekend, and some of the naturopaths in Canada are doing a fabulous job there. Um, So I would just say work with someone like a naturopathic physician to go through the MSIDS model, go through it piece by piece. All of the protocols, again, are laid out in much greater detail in my second book than in the first book. Um, And it's available for patients. So you can still get help with it. But ultimately, for the really, really sick patients, it is good to eventually try and get to a doctor. And if your regular PCP um, will not help you with it, most of the doctors who've been trained by IFM or some uh, ACAM, uh, A4M, IHS, any of those doctors who've been trained in integrative medicine who understand the integrative model Um, Those are usually the ones who will also understand how to use a lot of the treatment protocols that are in my book, which is a kind of classical slash integrative protocol, which I've found to be the most effective for treating these chronically ill patients. Very, very good. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about the mental, emotional aspects of illness. So how much of a role do you think that past mental, emotional, physical abuse, traumas, conflicts, all of those types of things, uh, how much of a role do those play in Lyme disease? And then how important is it to focus on improving mental, emotional health as part of overall treatment? Uh, It's very important to improve mental health. Approximately one third of the people who come to see me have had severe abuse whether it's emotional abuse, physical abuse, or sexual abuse. And I always ask women when they come in about that. And and it's unfortunately, uh, it's probably about a third of the women who come in who have had some form of abuse. And, you know, I, there's no doubt in my mind that Lyme is a full-blown worldwide epidemic, but unfortunately, so is abuse in my opinion. When I listen to some of these absolutely horrific stories that have happened to people early on in their childhood, um, I'm absolutely astounded 
that no one has addressed this at a federal national level as far as actually how prevalent this is in the United States and worldwide. It is very important because your immune system, there is a mind-body connection, it's well established in medicine with psychoneuroimmunology that the same inflammatory molecules that are produced during Lyme and co-infections are produced with emotional distress. And the people that come in with the worst PTSD are the most difficult patients to treat in my practice. There's one woman in specifically who had blocked out a rape when she was 12 years old and she went to someone who is skilled in dealing with these type of abuse, who uncovered it during the therapy. And once she finally dealt with these hidden memories of what had gone on, then when I treated her Lyme disease with her Bartonella and co-infections, she got much better and I could not get her better until the emotional piece had been resolved. And I've seen this over and over again, which is why we recommend to people uh, to go to good therapists um, and not just talk therapy, but consider things like EMDR, rapid eye movement techniques for some who have had deep emotional trauma, looking at cognitive behavioral therapies, neurofeedback. Um, I recommend regular biofeedback with the HeartMath biofeedback monitor. You can get it on heartmath.com. It's about $200. You can plug it into your iPhone. Very useful for teaching people to get into alpha wave states um, and relax their minds, but very, very important for people to feel their emotions and not block them out and deal with it because it is directly affecting um, your immune system and how it responds to illness. Yeah, absolutely agree. So maybe a philosophical question, but what is Lyme disease here to teach us? And is there a message in the misery? Probably the biggest message that I would say with Lyme disease, uh, because it is really one of the number one spreading epidemics in the 21st century, is that when we're all talking about healthcare politics and how do we lower down healthcare costs and how do we improve treatment for people who are chronically ill, what is being missed at this point, and I've posted, I did a Huffington Post piece about a month ago uh, that people can look up um, about the role of infections and environmental toxins in chronic illness. I think we are missing the boat on the role of these chronic infections and environmental toxins in chronic illness. Um, we are seeing that 87% of our healthcare costs and 70% of the deaths in the United States are due to chronic illness. Every 67 seconds, someone gets Alzheimer's disease in the United States. One in 150 children with, with autism spectrum disorder 15, 16 years ago is now to like um, a little over one in 60. Um, in some states, it's down to one in 48, like in Utah. Uh, you're looking at rises in many of these chronic illnesses. Um, the cancer rates are still very high. So we're not dealing with the chronic illnesses. And when you look at infections and environmental toxins, it's driving a lot of it. And due to healthcare politics and due to fighting among physicians and the lack of people at the upper levels who are, who are dealing with healthcare are not listening to people on the ground at this point, they have allowed a lot of these problems because they have just not listened to doctors on the ground saying, hey, listen, we're seeing a lot of sick people. Please listen to us. Let's get to a table. Let's all get together and let's find solutions. And I think this lack of communication between people in the ivory towers and people in very high political positions who are dealing with healthcare policy, there's just a lack of adequate communication and there's been a lack of compassion of simply listening to sick and suffering people and to say, hey, we can't allow, you know, 400,000 people a year minimally are being diagnosed with Lyme in the United States, according to the CDC. And the numbers are probably anywhere between at least one to two million people when you look at including chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and autoimmune illness, which is actually Lyme and, infect and co-infections and toxins mimicking these diseases in disguise. So there's a problem of compassion, of not looking for answers, of not listening, of inadequate communication. And I think if we're really gonna solve the healthcare epidemic, we need to open chronic disease centers of excellence. The HMO 15 minute model of trying to deal with chronically ill people by dealing with one symptom in a 12 minute visit is just not gonna make it when you're looking at chronic diseases being the number one cause of what's driving healthcare costs, um, causing chronic illness and deaths in this country um, and causing a tremendous amount of suffering. So the, the issue for me is it's got to be better communication. We're talking, you know, the C's, communication, compassion, listening at this point and getting people to tables where we get, you know, a lot of people from the insurance agencies um, and the politicians and the infectious disease doctors and the primary care doctors and the sociologists and the PhD researchers 
everyone's got to come together to look at these spreading epidemics that are going on across our country and say, listen, we have some of the best and brightest people in this country. And if we sit down and we really try and figure this out, we will do this. It's not that these are insoluble problems, but we've got to all come together and work as one and stop fighting among groups of doctors and where we don't listen from one group to the next. Otherwise, these chronic illnesses and the suffering are just going to keep going on. I think that's the thing that really amazes me about you is you're a very busy clinician, but you have also been a huge catalyst and a bridge to try to really bring the conversation together. I know you've worked with other countries and working on future plans for creating ways for people to access care. And so I don't know how you do it. <laughs> I know you're involved in so many things, but um, I certainly appreciate it. So I'm going to wrap up with a couple of other questions here. So besides singing Ballad of the Deer Tick and taking sulforaphane, <laughs> what do you do to optimize your health on a regular basis? Um, well, I could probably bring the computer screen over to the 40 supplements that are on my counter that I'm looking at in <laughs> back of me. Uh, so, you know, most people are not going to do what I do. But here's essentially what I try and do to stay healthy. I try and get on my tre treadmill for at least 20 minutes a day in the morning before I go to work. I got a treadmill with a desk on it because I found that I need to multitask. I just don't have enough time in the day. So I get a good, you know, good 20 minute walk in at least at 3.3 miles per hour, kind of trying to do high intensity interval training towards the end of it, because it's shown that that has tremendous effects on lowering inflammation, increasing mitochondrial function. Um, I try and eat organic as much as possible, eating lots of fruits and vegetables, keeping it mainly to the fruits that are low carb fruits, because at this point, a paleo Mediterranean style diet with lots of extra virgin olive oil, clean meats and fish, um, with lots of cruciferous vegetables has been shown essentially to be the diet that works for most. And for me, it's a hypoglycemic, small frequent meals during the day that works best. I take supplements knowing the amount of uh, in toxins that are getting into my body. I am working my detox pathways with um, 600 to 1200 milligrams of NAC twice a day, alpha lipoic acid twice a day, which not only gently pulls out uh, heavy metals, but also helps with insulin resistance um, and helps with driving mitochondrial production in the body and 30% more glutathione using alpha lipoic acid. I do take um, liposomal glutathione to pull out the toxins. I take methylation cofactors like methyl B12 because my homocysteine was high. I don't eat a lot of fish anymore, but I do take two grams of an omega-3 fatty acid that is mercury-free with high amounts of DHA because that has been shown to be beneficial. I take several different probiotics because it's clearly been shown that the microbiome of the gut has been shown to be linked up to cardiovascular disease, autoimmune disease, and inflammation. So I will take a lot of good healthy bifidobacterium which stick in the lower colon and um, healthy acidophilus. So I'm, I'm probably taking two to 300 billion every day, even though I'm not on any antibiotics. Um, I am taking mitochondrial regeneration. I am taking fruit and, uh, fruit and vegetable supplements. Um, so I am taking a lot, even, even adrenal support at this point, knowing the way I work, because I'm working from morning to night. And even though my DHEA cortisol testing was normal, I'm using adaptogenic herbs just to support my adrenal because I'm working so hard while making sure that I try and get up to eight hours of sleep per night um, because sleep, exercise, and diet, I mean, is clearly some of the most important things you can do. Um, of course, spending more time with your wife and people who make you laugh um, being also extremely important following a spiritual path. I still have over um, one hour of spiritual practice that I do every day. Um, and for those people who can find time to do meditation, um, the recent studies that have come out of the University of Wisconsin and Elizabeth Blackburn is that if you can do 30 minutes of meditation a day, it actually lengthens the telomeres in your body and helps with uh, hopefully uh, extending your life. It lowers inflammatory cytokines the same way a lot of other things uh, that we do help our health. So meditation, diet, exercise, um, having something that you do that feeling benefits people, because obviously having a job and doing something that benefits people, having a purpose in your life is extremely important. And by the way, it's not just being a doctor. Anything you do that goes out and helps the world and helps people um, is very important because each one of us has to make a difference. But for staying healthy, you have to have that strong purpose in your life, um, which is, you know, why you're here and what you're going to do to benefit the planet, because Life is very impermanent. And, you know, you're asking me, how do I fit so much in a day and why do I do it? I'm very conscious of impermanence. 
I'm very conscious that I will not be around forever. And the only reason I've spent all this time writing these books that if I didn't get this information out to the doctors because my practice is you know, essentially closed, we'll be probably opening it up later this year. I'm hiring a new PA um, who was uh, Dr. Oz's PA for about seven years. Um, she's joining me and actually next week, she's starting the training, we're looking for more help. Um, you've got at this point to be able to have a lifestyle where your fear is benefiting people, but I've written these books basically to get this information out because it's a worldwide epidemic. Millions of people per year are getting it. Um, by accident, I think I have found answers for many people, um, not just for lying for many of the chronic illnesses, but we all have to work uh, for the benefit of others, for the benefit of this earth, which is having such a tough time right now between everything going on um, on this planet. And, and I think if we all come together and everybody says, what can I do to benefit others? What can I do to benefit this planet? Um, if everyone were to take that attitude in medicine, no matter what your job is, with your family, your friends, um, the world will end up being a better place. And, you know, I thank some of this motivation to teachers that I've had years ago who explained to me that the motivation to benefit others is just essentially the most important thing you do in healthcare, the most important thing you do in your life, because ultimately um, it will lead to great benefit, not just for yourself, but for others. That was fantastic. Uh, amazing. And keep taking your telomere lengthening supplements because we need you around for a long, long time. And clearly your brain is working really well. So those things are doing a pretty good job. So let's talk just a little bit briefly as we wrap up about the two books. Uh, so we've got uh, Why Can't I Get Better? We've also got How Can I Get Better? So um, do people need to start with the first book? Can they go directly to the second book? Maybe you can comment a little bit on the two books. Yeah, so the, the difference with the two books is um, when I wrote the first book, I knew that I was going to have to get a lot of the detailed information um, of all of the science in there because I knew that the CDC and NIH and many people were going to be reading this book, looking at the science. Um, so there are hundreds of scientific references in the back of both books. Um, this last book that I wrote, How Can I Get Better?, there's about 850 scientific references. The first book gives people more of an overview of the disease, how I got into it. Um, it will give people more of the biochemistry of some of the way these pathways work. There are a lot more clinical studies in the first book because the second book was designed to be an easier to read book with all of the updates in the last four years. So you can start with the second book. There's no reason for it. But the only reason I sometimes suggest that people actually get through the first book is that what people have told me is when they've read the first book and they've actually gone through it several times, by the time they've gotten to the second book, even people who have no medical training whatsoever say they really get it. And people have told me that the second book is definitely easier to read than the first. I'm not sure if that's my writing style or because people have just gotten educated over the years, but there is a lot of new information in the second book. My publisher was trying to get me to write a second book for years, and I said, listen, until I've got something really new to say, I just don't see the point. But if you read the first book and then you read the second, you'll actually see that there's a lot of new things in the second book about the scoring of the HMQ, the MSIDS questionnaire, um, about the number of patients with Lyme disease. There's a whole new chapter on persisting and pulsing. Um, there's a lot of new information on Alzheimer's disease, on autism, on ALS. Um, you'll see there's a lot of new things about environmental toxins causing autoimmune illness, um, about the exercise chapters and high intensity interval training. I basically updated the first book where I took what I thought was the most essential information and then updated it chapter by chapter, even things like we didn't know what caused star eye in the first book. We know it's Borrelia sensulatu species in the second book. We didn't know what caused Morgellons disease in the first book. We learned that it was Borrelia sensulatu species in the second book. I think it's fascinating to go through it piece by piece because the patients have to be well educated. And I think really understanding this and reading the clinical histories is important. But definitely for someone that doesn't have the time to get through the, both books, um, it's fine to start with the second book, but there is a lot more information and uh, more case studies in the second book. And just so you know, I have a third contract, uh, which is going to take me a while to get to. Um, I'm debating with St. Martin's how this is going to unfold. Um, the third book is going to actually, for me, maybe be the most exciting uh, because it's going to go very broad, not just for Lyme, but for many chronic diseases, showing people uh, how the MSIDS model is applying. Um, it, it's going to be quite fascinating, but the problem I face is finding the time actually to do this and to do all of the things that I'm doing. 
Um, but what's, I think, important for people to know about the second book is if your doctor is not Lyme literate, uh, they can read these books and really understand what to do. And in the second book, all of the details of what I do in my office, I gave away all of the secrets of the dosage of the drugs, how I rotate them, the side effects, the names of the nutritional supplements. I gave it all away for people who cannot get into my practice so that you could have the same type of information that is benefiting my patients. And it's amazing because I think on Amazon right now, you're giving it away for about $11 and change. I, I don't know how you put so much effort into it and can uh, sell it so cheaply. <laughs> well, well, the answer is, is you don't write books to make money and you don't write books to be famous. You write books because you have something important to say. And as a friend of mine who has published before said, you could have made more money working at McDonald's than you spent writing this book. And that's actually true. I spent a year and a half writing this book I spent all of the money they gave me for the book buying my own books to give out for free to every member of Congress. Um, I will be driving it to Washington, D.C. next month to give out to every member of Congress and the House and the Senate. We did this for the first book. It will be sent to every governor in the U.S. So um, this is essentially kind of a labor of love, meaning you see that, you know, I've been God has basically graced me with the fact that I've been put in a position to benefit people. And it's really my job at this point to get the information out. Um, so I have to make this book available and cheap so people basically can get the information that they need and that cost is not going to be a factor. Yeah, that's amazing. And I'm actually enjoying reading the second book and I do it while I'm in the far infrared sauna. So I'm getting a double whammy there. So it's fantastic. I want to thank you for everything that you do for those that are still dealing with Lyme or have dealt with Lyme. You continue to be a bridge and a catalyst for change, um, definitely helping patients uh, get to higher ground, not only with your treatment, but with your activism and your politics. And so for that, I appreciate you. I thank you very much. I thank you for taking the time today to be on the show and appreciate your time. Oh, thank you so much, Scott. And by the way, just a uh, kudos to you. I do many of these interviews. Uh, you are a fabulous interviewer. You're very fluid. You know the information. Uh, kudos to you because uh, you really do uh, excellent interviewing. And congratulations for you for staying on top of all the literature and also being a voice for the patients out there, uh, making the information available to them. Thank you. Coming from you, that means a lot. I appreciate it very much. And talk to you soon. Okay. For more information on today's guest, visit CanGetBetter.com. That's CanGetBetter.com. Dr. Horowitz's books are available on Amazon. The first book, Why Can't I Get Better, is available at BetterHealthGuy.link forward slash Why Can't I Get Better. The second book, How Can I Get Better, is available at BetterHealthGuy.link forward slash How Can I Get Better. You can also go directly to Amazon and search for Richard Horowitz, MD. I appreciate your support of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. If you'd like to follow me, you can find me on Facebook and Twitter as Better Health Guy. The show can be found on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. If you'd like to support the show, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash donate. And if you'd like to be added to my newsletter, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash newsletters. I'm looking forward to many more shows ahead and appreciate your interest. Thanks for listening to this Better Health Guy blogcast with Scott, your Better Health Guy. To check out additional shows and learn more about Scott's personal journey to better health, please visit BetterHealthGuy.com.